at Houston City Hall, more bribery and corruption bubbling to the surface. Will the guilty plea of a key mayoral aide cascade into more convictions within a Turner administration long accused of pay-to-play governance? And amid record inflation, Democrats on county commissioner's court asking taxpayers to shoulder another billion dollars plus in debt. As folks in Harris County tighten their financial belts, should local government be asked to do the same? And in the state of Florida, feds descend on the home of the former president. Will the court-ordered search for top secret materials generate evidence of a genuine crime? I'm Greg Grugan and welcome to Watch Your Point where our panelists call it like they see it. Let's greet them. Starting us off, longtime super neighborhood leader, Tamaro Bell. Next up, Holly Hansen, political writer with the Texan. In the three spot, well-known attorney and conservative commentator, Gary Polland. Batting cleanup, Marcus Davis, highly regarded restaurateur and host of Fish, Grits and Politics. And closing us out, longtime Houston journalist and social worker, Chow Wen. Let's begin. I personally approve the decision to seek a search warrant in this matter. In a law enforcement action unprecedented in the 246 year history of this nation, federal agents this week entered the home of a former president to serve a search warrant. We have learned in the days since that Donald Trump is suspected of transporting critical national security documents classified as top secret out of the White House to his mansion in Mar-a-Lago and upon court subpoena, refused to return them. If that allegation proves true, then the former president has broken the law. But if this warrant turns up no evidence of wrongdoing, Attorney General Merrick Garland, President Joe Biden, and the Democratic Party will face a firestorm of justified blowback and hand Don Donald J. Trump an opportune launching pad for a 2024 run. Panel, the former president calls the FBI raid a weaponization of the Justice Department. Given what we know, what is your point? I'm going to start with our attorney, Gary Polland. Well, you know, that's an interesting question because we don't know enough about this. Uh, if we know, here's what we know. We know that the uh, Tr Trump administration uh, had cooperated with the archives. He turned over 15 boxes in the spring. We know there was uh, another visit in June where they told him they wanted the stuff properly secured and gave him instructions how to do it. The understanding that was done, but then now we have this subpoena that came out allegedly that asked for things they say they never got. So we still don't know enough. And I think you characterize it really good, Greg. If if, in fact, uh, Trump has kept confidential documents despite the request of the archives return, he's not much different than Hillary Clinton, but it is a violation of the law and improper, okay? Uh, and, and I think that Trump will end up looking bad. However, if, if it's the other side, and there's really much ado about nothing, what the, the administration has done has elevated Donald Trump. It's made him a martyr. At a time we were going up a few months ago, Till now, his numbers were starting to decline with Republicans. So it looks like uh, the Democrats clearly want to run against Donald Trump again. And I guess they want him to run for president in 2024. Uh, my personal preference is I'd like to see new faces. All right, Marcus Davis, I am eager to hear your take on this. So there, there, there are things that we don't know, <clears throat> but there are things that we do know as well, right? We do know that the FBI took their time uh, in doing this. And I have heard Republican after Republican say, I hate this committee. This committee is lopsided. If they're going to do anything, the Department of Justice needs to step up. Well, here the Department of Justice has stepped up. So we do know that the FBI took their time. We do know that the Department of Justice took their time in deliberating over this and in handling this. Secondly, we do know that a judge took the FBI warrant and overlooked it, a judge that had been reported by a Republican, right, that has that has been known to be friends with both Democrats and Republicans. So we, we can't see any bias there. Judge took the time, opened the warrant, saw fit to go ahead and issue the warrant. We do know that President Donald J. Dumbass Trump has had a history of violating several um, protocols in that office. That is not 
foreign to his behavior. So we know that he's believed that he's been above the law, and this would be no different. Now, one thing I do have issue with is I appreciate the commentary, uh, uh, Greg and Gary, but why do we give this if he did, if he didn't, if he is? When do we do that in other cases for private citizens when the FBI goes in to take control of a situation where criminal activity has been alleged? We don't give, if Marcus Davis had his home raided by the FBI, we wouldn't be saying, well, if they're right, they'll they'll do this. And if they're wrong, they'll do this. No, we bring the damn it down because damn it, we know, we know that this man is dirty. We just need to find out how to prove it. Tell uh, and probably a predictable bit of deflection, the former president has suggested, well, maybe the FBI went in there and planted something. Does this whole scenario trouble you? Boris, how have we ever known Donald Trump to be any different than a man who colors outside the lines? He's a petulant child who comes up against the Justice Department and says, no, politicizes something that is really important. We've got to get to the bottom of this. The FBI needs to do its job in this case and let justice fall, let the chips fall where they may when it comes to investigating something very serious with Donald Trump. And when it comes to all the political talk, like, well, maybe this will, you know, deter him from running in 2024. We're not there yet. We just need to know, just like Gary said, what is going on and what's at the bottom of all this. All right, Holly Hansen, there was lots of support for the former president on Capitol Hill, particularly uh, uh, from those members of Congress who are strong supporters. Uh, What's your take? Well, you know, first of all, I'd like to say that it's not just Republicans and Trump supporters that have concerns about the way this went down. We're talking about the former governor of New York, Andrew Cuomo, not exactly known as a as a Trump supporter. Uh, There's also some concerns about the judge here, the federal magistrate who uh, went ahead and and issued this and approved this. Uh, He's a very partisan person Uh, who's made so many public statements about Donald Trump and uh, had to recuse himself in a previous lawsuit regarding Trump because of his public statements. So, you know, there are a lot of questions that still need to be answered. We don't know what was collected or what this is all regarding. It does not have to do with January 6th. It's about these documents. And, you know, you also look at the fact that the Trump administration had been working to declassify certain documents regarding Hillary Clinton's emails and the uh, the dossier that was discredited. A lot of questions that still need to be answered. All right, tomorrow, Bell, bring it home. Listen, who appointed Mary Garland? Trump. Anytime you go outside their lines or whatever, then they're gonna say, you ain't right. Oh, we love the blue, we protect the blue. That's bull, they, they don't, when that blue go after Trump. And look, the country is first. He is not above the country. I can't get y'all, I mean, I don't know what Kool-Aid y'all be drinking that no matter what he do is right. We always say exactly like Marcus said, when the FBI has come to a local citizens here in Houston, we never said, oh, if what? They make sure they cross every line and dot every T before they come after you. Believe you me, whatever they got in them first boxes, that they saw when they got it from him, they were like, oh hell, if he got this, he must have this because it was right next to it. Sure enough, that's why they went back in. We'll find out when they tell us what's in there and how they got where they are. Okay, you are right on most things, but Merrick Garland was appointed by Joe Biden. Um, I mean, I'm sorry, I, meant to, I, I didn't mean to say that. I'm no sorry. problem, no problem. Like I said, you're right on most stuff, all right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Still to come, bribery at Houston City Hall. Could the guilty plea entered by a key aide to Mayor Sylvester Turner cascade into additional criminal charges? And in our Sunday survey, we're asking viewers if they believe corruption is rare or common when it comes to our municipal and Harris County leaders. Vote now on our website at fox26houston.com or use our mobile app and click on Tell 26. But up next, loads of undocumented immigrants bust by Governor Abbott from the Texas border to the Big Apple. With plenty of national coverage, are Democrats finally getting the point? New York is a sanctuary city. Uh, Mayor Adams said that they welcome in uh, illegal immigrants. Texas Governor Greg Abbott drawing national attention this week after shipping busloads of uninvited immigrants from the border of the Lone Star State all the way to the Big Apple. 
infuriated New York Mayor Eric Adams called Abbott, quote, a global embarrassment. Abbott firing back, essentially calling Adams a hypocrite. Panel, we know the governor is sending these buses to New York and the nation's capital as a protest of President Biden's open border policy, which is frankly flooding Texas with uninvited immigrants. Question, is Abbott's tactic working? I start with you, Holly Hansen. Yes, I think it is working. Let's just look at some numbers. In the month of June alone, there were 128,000 immigrant encounters in Texas alone. And we sent 360 to New York City. And then you have the New York City mayor saying this is overwhelming and inhumane. These people volunteered. They wanted to go to New York City. Uh, you know, it, it's really an interesting contrast when you have an affluent urban center like New York City saying they cannot handle 360, but you have these lower socioeconomic uh, communities down along the border handling thousands per day. I think in the last 24 hours, I saw there were about 2,000 that came across that they know of. That does not include the gotaways and does not include those that are undetected because we don't have enough resources at the border. It's time that, you know, some of these open border folks, uh, sanctuary city folks and who are far removed from the situation, got to see what Texans are dealing with on a daily basis. Chow Wen, this all underscores the need for immigration reform. We can, I think, all agree on that. But what did you think of, 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 of Holly's uh, points there? Well, I think it, just a political tactic at the expense of human beings, bringing them all the way. Of course, these are uh, citizens, you know, immigrants who want a better life. But to to, to have it both ways, for Greg Abbott to say, yes, I want to close the borders, but no, I'm going to make a political point. To me, this just adds more fuel to the fire. We've got groups like Mothers Against Greg Abbott. Uh, we know by some statistics that Beto has a six-point lead over women. Uh, this does not help Greg Abbott's case. I mean, he's gone from attacking transgenders to women's rights on the abortion issue and now to immigration and pulling another political uh, ploy to bring immigrants. Uh, it's not helping his cause as he's up for election. Got 20 seconds to rebut, Gary. Sorry. Yeah, that's flatly not true. Uh, what Greg Abbott has done is bring attention to this issue around the country. The major media has basically ignored the invasion of the illegal immigrants at our border. We don't control our border. Greg Abbott is spending state money to finish the wall. These are all good things. I mean, I think we all support legal immigration. So does Greg Abbott. Give us a bill that says that. But Adams is wrong. The mayor of Washington, D.C. is wrong. And, and we need to send him not 360, but 100,000. That's what we need to do. Tomorrow, I'll get back to you on the next, uh, in the next segment, okay? When we come back, a big win for Joe Biden in Congress. But will the Inflation Reduction Act prove a bait and switch for the American public he serves? The world will be a better place for my grandchildren because of what we did today. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer downright giddy over the narrow passage of the so-called Inflation Reduction Act, so-called because experts say the roughly $700 billion measure will have very little impact on prices. What it will do is funnel a huge amount of cash into the battle against climate change, a big Biden campaign promise. The bill funds itself with a 15% tax on corporations and an increase in tax collection facilitated by the creation of 87,000 new positions at the Internal Revenue Service. They're not being created to audit billionaires or giant corporations. They're being created to audit you. Check out this tweet from Congressman Dan Crenshaw, who says, we have only 19,536 Border Patrol agents to secure our southern border. Democrats just voted to hire 87,000 more IRS agents to harass Americans. Panel, with that, I ask what's your point. Tomorrow, Bill, personal privilege, go ahead. Listen, okay, I, I agree with you all. Hiring all them IRS people, they already showed the racism, the racism that exists and how they go for low-income people and not billionaires, okay? That's all I got to say about that. Let me get back to that border. Listen, I think Abbott is right. I don't care. Don't write me. Don't tell me nothing. I don't even do Instagram. I ain't got no Facebook. He is right because the schools here in Texas and, and the hospitals are overburdened, and it's good for somebody to tell you, girl, keep all them over there. You good, you good, until you send them to them so they can feel what you feel because these people want to come 
to America. This ain't no, I don't get a free flight to you uh, to, to where I want to go. They're taking them to America. It's different spots of America. Texas ain't the only spot. And you talk about that wall, San Diego but had a wall up over that freeway over 12 years. There ain't nothing new. Marcus Davis, did Democrats just raise your taxes uh, without lowering your expenses? <laughs> well, let, let's, let's start with, with, with the top, you know, above the fold, right? The name of this bill is a problem, right? I, and I have, I have spoke often about the idea that Congress needs to find a better way of operating than naming a bill and then throwing 37,000 layers into that same bill. Why can't we make bills simple? Why can't we make them one page, two page, and about a particular issue? That's one. Two, yeah. during the pandemic, when businesses were struggling to keep their doors open, to pay employees, and to keep uh, uh, customers coming in the door, I recommended time after time after time, if you want to solve the economic problem, it's not about opening the front door, it's about employing the, the uh, small business uh, center in United, United States government, making sure that the SBA was well equipped to handle. They went out and found laymen to answer calls that had no experience in handling business. If they had took this 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 strategy and put eighty seven thousand new hirees or, or new people in the SBA, we could have handled the economic crisis different. Additionally, the subsidizing of microchips an issue we ignored for years, and now you're going to give billions of dollars to big corporations to go out and get. Uh, uh, the contracts to do these deals when you would not give money to Main Street businesses, restaurant tours, bars, restaurants when we were struggling and you and Congress denied the opportunity to subsidize that effort. This is garbage. I think the Democrats are full of it. I think Congress as a whole is full of it to ignore Main Street businesses when they were trying to do their best and you did not weaponize the SBA, but yet you go weaponize the IRS and you raise my taxes. I'm a corporation. I'm a Main Street business, but I'm a corporation. And you raise my taxes. And Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, Democratic Party, shame on you because you said you wouldn't. Gosh, Chow, the conservatives haven't even talked on this yet. And uh, the Biden administration is not faring well. Can they can this help them in the midterms? I think in the long term, when we're looking at a 10 year plan, there is some misinformation on this whole issue. There is a huge attrition rate out there. It's like, look, nobody wants to pay more taxes. That's, that's the bottom line. And if there's a, a gap in missing IRS income for the wealthiest 1%, then let's go find that. There's a 50% attrition rate. There will be IRS employees who will be retiring. And this number of 87,000, I mean, we're looking over 10 years. They're thinking maybe 20,000. Uh, you know, it's just what happens, the news comes out and then people go, oh my gosh, that's 87,000 collectively. Nobody wants taxes raised. And I feel for Marcus, he's a businessman. He's running a great business. And, and you know, time is money and money is short and many's tight. All right, stay with us in overtime because I know Holly Hansen and Gary Pollan want to unload on this. Okay, just ahead, as if we aren't already reeling from historic inflation, Texans now bracing for a higher cost cell service. And it appears Republicans in Austin have to accept the blame. Welcome back. Millions of Texans bushwhacked in recent weeks by a major increase in the price they pay to use a cell phone. The extra expense was triggered by Governor Greg Abbott's Public Utility Commission, which raised a tax it charges phone companies 800%. The phone companies, at least my phone company, immediately passed the charge on to customers like me. Now, according to reports, this universal service fee subsidizes service to rural areas and has been chronically underfunded for years to the tune of $200 million at last count. Panel, since Republicans have been in control since 1995, I think it's their responsibility. Much like the additional fees on power and natural gas, we are all paying after last year's winter grid collapse. Holly, I've been following the Texans reporting on this. What can you tell us? 
Well, first of all, I want to give kudos to Brad Johnson at the Texan, who's been out in front on this issue for months now, long before anybody else was paying attention to it. You know, this is not a bad program. It's to provide phone service to rural areas for emergencies, but that comes at a cost. These are satellite uh, phones and so forth, and someone's going to have to pay for it. There's no such thing as a free lunch is what we used to say, but they've been kicking the can down the road. There was a bill in the state legislature last year that passed that would have addressed this in a more incremental fashion. Uh, the governor did veto that bill, but now it's time to pay the piper. There was a lawsuit, uh, one of the companies, these are private companies that are mandated to provide these services, they have to be paid or they're going to go out of business. Marcus isn't in uh, business as a charity. He's got to make money to pay his people and to, uh, to feed his family. Same with these companies. They cannot do this for free. And now the state owes them millions of dollars and it's accumulating quickly. So now we've all got to pay for it. And this is a great lesson. And, you know, there's a lot of great government programs out there that are good, uh, good ideas, but they have to be paid for. And it's not like at the federal level where you can, you know, print more money or borrow from China or, uh, you know, raise taxes very easily. It's got to be paid for. I'll tell you, the lesson I learned is that when government screws up, they pass the cost on to me. And that happened this time. <laughs> and it happened when the grid. Gary, you know, Greg Abbott's in charge of this PUC. What the heck's going on? Well, I, I've, I'm not sure what's going on. But my answer is the state has considerably increased revenue this biennium because of oil and gas prices going up. So my suggestion to the governor is to pass a bill on the legislature to take state money to replace the money that was never paid. Look, I drove through West Texas in the last week and there are parts of West Texas, believe it or not, there's no cell service at all. So the universal service charge makes perfect sense if you want people who live in rural areas to be able to communicate. And I think it's important, uh, but the way this is, was handled by the PUC is, is not acceptable. So this should become a priority. They need to deal with it. And I think the governor should address it in that way and move on down the road. Oh, Tomorrow, what so, do you think of this? Oh. Me? Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry okay. I didn't hear you. All right, listen. How the hell are you going to make people in the city pay for a screw up you made at the state? That's not even logical. Cell phones are not a luxury anymore. They are a necessity. They are a part of our, our daily living. So the point that you're going to raise bills this high so the people may not even be able to afford to keep their phone, it makes no sense. Like Gary said, you got a whole rainy day fund. It's the storm. We didn't got rain that they never seen on the planet. And you still say, I ain't giving a dollar. Take some of that state money and cover your screw up. Final 30 to Marcus. Yeah, I, I this I'm I'm baffled because it seems as though the GOP is saying it's okay to tax everybody for a group of people. I seem to recall that the GOP didn't like the way that worked when it came to health care. I seem to recall that the GOP didn't like that standard. So we're saying now that it's okay to take from the big people, you know, the big pot, you know, the 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 the, the main crew, so that it, and spread it out amongst everybody. If that's how we're playing the game, let's play the game that way. But don't criticize when other legislation provides that same method. Got to leave Excellent. it there. Up next, say it ain't so. Corruption at Houston City Hall. Could the ongoing bribery scandal involving the mayor's council li liaison grow deeper? Our team is set to offer intel and predictions on the other side of this break. Welcome back. We've all had 10 days to process a stunning or maybe not so stunning development at Houston City Hall where the mayor's director of city council relations, William Paul Thomas, resigned after pleading guilty to a federal charge of accepting a bribe. While this is hardly the first case of corruption within the Turner administration to draw prosecution, it may prove the most significant. That's because William Paul Thomas has had a front row seat to the inner workings of Mayor Sylvester Turner's administration from the get-go. I would venture to guess thousands of confidential conversations and transactions. Now, based on the legal filings, experts say it appears Thomas has been fully cooperating with investigators. What's unknown is what kind of information or evidence that cooperation has generated. Now, while the mayor says he knew nothing of the allegations, Council member Michael Kubosh called the conviction the latest example of a quote, culture of corruption that's germinated under Turner. Panel, with that said, I ask what's your point and further, what's your prediction? Can hardly wait to hear from tomorrow, Bell. 
Okay, first off, let me explain something to you all. This thing was signed on June the 30th. Now, he just resigned after that, but this was signed on June the 30th. So if he was signing it and accepting uh, responsibility June 30th, he'd been working with them for a minute. That's number one. Number two, the things that are in the charges against him, the TCO and the TABC, I don't believe those have anything to do with what they're really looking at. The FBI don't give a damn about that. Remember when it says this occurred. The TABC was issued in April 2020 when a restaurant was trying to get opened open now Marcus can tell you you only need a TCO when you're first opening because you'll get your CO after that so this isn't uh the breakfast club this is not turkey leg this is not Lucille's this is not Papa Do's this is not a restaurant that was already open so y'all need to quit suggesting that number one the second thing this was a bar that TABC shut down which saying that the bar was pretending to be the breakfast club or turkey leg or Lucille's or any of those or taste they were not that the only person that could get you a TABC deferred anything is a state level individual. The city has nothing to do with that. And TCOs are issued by multiple people at the city. This was no big deal. You could get a TCO. You, I don't know why they paid them the money they paid them, but that's the crime. Not the TCO, not the T, the crime was the bribe. That is the crime. And I'm letting you all know, this is just the beginning. Anybody think this is over you out of your mind? This is just the beginning. And let me tell y'all about my boy, William Paul. He been there before all, okay, before all. He goes back to when Rodney was a city council member. He has been, he has worked with almost every Democrat politician in this city and in many in the state. So he has a long reach, okay? What everybody hoping and wondering who nervous is are they finna be snatched? All right, Gary Pollan, I frequently call you for advice on criminal cases and, and for your take. What's your take here? Is this a one and done or do you see more happening? No, no, because the charge was so minor. The amount of money, remember in federal court, the amount of money involved in the, in the crime is very important in sentencing guidelines. As the more money involved, the better chance you have of ended being locked up and going to federal prison where there is no parole. So the minor charges he got is a signal to me that he has cut a deal. He's cooperating and he's singing. And uh, for those who are involved in grafting corruption in the city of Houston, I'd be having sleepless nights because they're coming for you at some point. And now what was going on? The other thing that, in fact, I provided it to you, I think last week, Greg, some information on briberies going on relative to uh, uh, clubs that stay up late or stay open late, that they've gotten forbearance from the city if they paid off the right politicians. So there's all kinds of stuff going on with this and it's the tip of the iceberg. Unfortunately, uh, Sylvester has stocked his administration with uh, people involved in nefarious activities. Don't forget, this is the same guy who tried to do the sweetheart deal with his law partner on an apartment complex. So it's it's not good. Uh, when will the other shoe drop is the big question. Will it happen before the election? I don't know. If it does, it reinforces the whole idea that we have a culture of corruption in Harris County government with the Democrats and in the city of Houston. Quickly, Chow, put on your journalist hat. Is this smoke or is there fire here? Well, listen, I, I, I'm gonna call the elephant in the room. I mean, we, we, are, we are looking at racial overtones. I don't know, Marcus, you're gonna agree with me, but this is a slippery slope. Look, Mayor Turner's got 22,000 people on his watch. And there are going to be a lot of directors and such who are running the city. But I, I've learned this a long time ago. You cannot address anything without addressing race in the room. Woo! Marcus, the race card. So let's play the partisan card, right? Because the words that Gary Pollitt just spewed could easily have been spewed in the first segment with Donald J. Trump. Yet, Gary, you chose not to apply the same tactic and the same logic to I Donald Trump. To no, sir, you did not say, happen. let's wait and see. No, sir, you did not say it's probable that on the good side, it didn't happen, and on the bad side, it didn't happen. No, sir, okay. you did not play that card. Well, you this decided to go guilty, in and say it's a culture guilty. of corruption when you know damn well that Donald dumbass Trump is a culture of corruption by his own self, and you refuse to admit it. But yet, when it comes to the okay. mayor, you're readily stating well, what happens. You, Maybe it's because it's you Democrats the question, and not Republicans. Marcus, Furthermore, Council Member Kubash, you talk about this culture of corruption. You, sir, have been on council. And how did you allow this culture of corruption to fester? Is it because you're running no for power. a new seat? I don't know. 
All, All right, we've got to leave it there. We're getting back to Holly on this in overtime. Still to come, big buzz this week over Beto's gun control F-bomb. But can the Democrat for governor transform internet clicks into real votes come November? But up next, he's claiming the safety of folks in Harris County's Precinct 2 has been sacrificed by Commissioner Adrian Garcia. Republican candidate Jack Borman makes the case for serious change on the other side of this break. In just 85 days, more than a million people in Harris County's Precinct 2 will choose a commissioner to represent their interests. It's a job Republican Jack Mormon held for eight years and wants back badly, claiming rampant crime on the watch of incumbent Adrian Garcia has undermined public safety and left residents deeply fearful. The number one priority for everybody that I talk to is crime. Uh, they want to be safe in their communities. It starts with Adrian, a former police officer, a former sheriff of Harris County, and Lena and Rodney are right there with them. Those three have defunded police. They have. They will say they have not all day long. They have taken away money from every single constable, from the sheriff's office, and from the DA. That's just a fact. They've not given our men and women in blue the resources they need to effectively fight crime and keep us all safe in our homes and our communities. They'll claim we spent $50 million fighting crime by building sidewalks and painting fences and planting trees. Greg, $50 million will put approximately 500 new patrolmen and women on the streets if they so choose, and they haven't. That is an abomination. The people that know Adrian the best, the men and women in blue, all of them are supporting me. Every single law enforcement association or organization that has taken a side in this race are endorsing me. You have to have priorities and your priorities have to be right. They have to reflect the values of the people you represent. So first and foremost, I prioritize law enforcement. I give them the tools that they need to do their job effectively, and we put more men and women out on the street, out on patrols. We make safety a number one priority. And secondly, in order to do that, in order to pay for that, without raising revenue, which we will not do if I'm on commissioner's court, is we have to cut bureaucracy. They've created new layers upon layers of government that never used to, do, used to exist before. County departments that never existed before. The county government doing things that county government ought not be doing, that has no business doing. So if we cut the fat, we can increase law enforcement without raising revenue. Appraisals are going up. We do not need to raise the tax rate to, to do all the things that we need to do to fix this county. The Latino community, just like everybody else, they want to feel safe. They want to be able to go about their lives, take care of their families, make a decent living, and, and have a better life for their children. And right now, the way this county is going, the way Precinct 2 is going, they don't feel that way. And they're ready for a change. I not only ask, is your life better than it was four years ago? I say, do you feel safer than you felt four years ago? And I say, if you can answer yes to those two questions, then don't vote for me, vote for my opponent. But if your answer is no, I do not feel safer in my community than I did four years ago. No, I'm not better off than I was four years ago. Then vote for a change. Don't keep doing the same thing over and over again and expect a different result. Just ahead, a billion dollar ask from the Democratic majority on commissioner's court. But are county taxpayers in any mood to back a pile of new debt amid historic inflation and their own financial insecurity? What my understanding is, there are unmet needs that if we don't pass this bond, we're going to drop below a level of service that the community has come to expect. Harris County Judge Lena Hidalgo justifying her vote to ask taxpayers for permission to borrow an additional $1.2 billion to fund unspecified improvements to roads, parks, and public safety facilities. Now, with $200 million still unspent from the last Parks and Roads debt package, Precinct 4 Commissioner Jack Cagle argues this is the wrong time to dig deeper into the pockets of working class families struggling to make ends meet amid historic inflation. But our income is larger than it's ever been before. This is not a revenue problem. This is a spending problem. Panel, somehow these bonds are approved. The property tax bill of the average Harris County homeowner will rise $32 per year. Holly, quickly, you've covered this issue. What's going on? 
Well, you know, you, you've had this explosion in county government. You've got a new layer of bureaucracy. You've got the highest paid employee as the county administrator at uh, $385,000 a year base salary. You've brought in a, a new elections administrator, again, from out of state, who will be making over $200,000 a year. Um, and, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. You've got all the spending and, you know, people are looking at this and saying, wait a minute, you know, yes, we want the county to focus on these core services the infrastructure, pu public safety, and so forth, but you still have $200 million from the last bond issue. Is it time to do this? It's probably going to be appropriate down the road, but I think the big question is right now, not sure. Tomorrow, Bell, are folks in the mood for this? Hell no. This is like the person who borrowed your shoes and didn't give them back, didn't ask to borrow the purse to match. Don't trust them because you ain't going to get neither one of them back. They haven't spent the money that they spent and they're, uh, they got more money this year than they ever got. Because let me tell you, you try to protest your taxes because the appraisals have been skyrocketed. Now they get in the news every day this week is how selling houses is dropping, selling houses is dropping. Because you can't sell your house for what they said it was worth. So listen, do not do this. We don't know what's on the horizon. And just like nobody expected a uh, gas to go to five dollars a gallon, they telling you, look, hey, give us some more money to screw over. You not only have the election administrator making more than both of the people who we elected to do that job, you now have the election the, uh, county administrator. Now you got a, an assistant administrator of criminal justice making a quarter of a million. This is ridiculous. Don't fall for this yokey doke. These people telling you, I'm your friend. Girl, I'm gonna bring your shoes back when I bring your purse back. Hell no, don't let them nothing. All right, Chow, when you think the timing is, is right on this? Look, Lena Hidalgo is a very smart woman, right? Oh, and she... the timing is terrible. This is a very difficult decision to ask for $1.2 billion. But uh, nobody really wants crime in their in their neighborhoods, bad streets. Uh, you know, this is a difficult decision. And she's making an announcement that she knows politically is probably not the right announcement to make. So if she needs a, a billion, a $1.2 billion to to keep our streets safe, to to improve infrastructure. That's a difficult decision to have to make, an announcement to have to make. All right, 15 <laughs> seconds, Gary. Yeah, if that was true, then why did the, the Democratic commissioners waste all that money over the last three or four years? And we're going to have a total in the next couple of weeks. But we're talking about almost a billion dollars that went into the toilet, 17 million for a hospital at Reliant for COVID patients that had no patients. And that's the tip of the iceberg. That's the problem. We have a spending problem. Not a taxing problem. Gotta leave it leave there, the Gary. Gotta alone. leave it there. We'll come back tomorrow. Coming up, fireworks on the campaign trail. Beto whistles an F-bomb at hecklers and harvests millions of hits. But will his bid to ban assault rifles gain any traction with voters? Up against kids at five feet. It may be funny to you, but it's not funny to me, okay? Both passionate and profane Democrat for Governor Beto O'Rourke hurling the F-bomb at a heckler disparaging his call to ban military-style semi-automatic rifles. The exchange went viral in the wake of Uvalde, a gun control position once viewed a surefire loser in Texas, has become far less of a liability for O'Rourke. Beto's very much keeping this alive in the way that he's talking about it. Scott Braddock of the Quorum Report, who says at the very least O'Rourke's no longer having to play defense on the issue. Thoughts? Uh, I'm going to go to you, Chow Win. Well, look, uh, Beto's a passionate person, and uh, it could go both ways, right? You can add field to this fire, and his base will be ignited because uh, AR-15 is a trigger word for him, clearly. I mean, we're talking about guns. We're talking about Uvalde. We're not over um, how difficult and how arduous and tragic that case was. So it, it's going to feel fire to his base, but yet I definitely see the other side saying the use of profanity, especially among elite conservatives, is, is not appropriate. All right, Marcus Davis, as an unabashed independent, uh, what was your take on this? And a gun owner. Let's, 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 let, well, I'm a gun owner, but let's just get to the, 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 the meat of it, right? We, we, we're actually sitting up here talking about grown folks cussing. 
Come on now, as though this is not the regular conversation that happens at, you know, in, in, in the restaurant, the regular conversation that happens in the bar, the regular conversation that happens in Congress behind when the microphone is not on. These are grownups, right? And grownups use these types of words. No, even no, it, it is. Oh, he cussed. Get the out of here with that. Yeah. That, is, that I mean, that that is such garbage. You now, can't say that, that on television. For the, for the, for the GOP, <laughs> let me quickly remind you, right? Because uh, our, our, our beloved uh, past president did, in fact, call the NFL players uh, sons of, <clears throat> mm, yeah. So let, let's not act like that this is, you can't say that and be an elected official. Get out of here. And it wasn't TV. All right, Holly, Holly, uh, does, <laughs> you know, what was your read on this? Is this just uh, well, much okay. ado about nothing? You know, uh, Mr. O'Rourke needed this distraction at earlier in the day or the day before. I can't remember which. He was practically run out of town on rail from, is it Rockdale? Uh, people were very upset and basically booed him out of the city. But, uh, you know, who cares what, you know, expletive he used? Uh, what I'm really interested in is, you know, the policy debate. You know, what policies are you proposing that might be efficacious for Texans, you know, who are dealing with inflation, rising crime, a border crisis? You know, let's talk about these policies. And I don't really care, you know, about his his potty mouth. Okay. Holly, Holly said what I said, but it, she did it better than I did. Fifteen <laughs> seconds, Gary Does right, this look, lose? Uh, does this lose Beto more more votes than it gains? Uh, I think it's a, a net neutral. It doesn't matter. I do think that uh, politicians who, in public, use profanity. Uh, it's not it's not appropriate, despite what Marcus says and what other people do. Not in the media. But uh, I think Beto want, doesn't want to talk about the real issues, open border, uh, runaway inflation, uh, his, his, his policies that enable crime, and his gun policies that want to take guns from law-abiding citizens like Marcus. Got to leave it there. Up next, I want my gun. Texans helping Texans with plenty of heartbreak still to bear. Our Houston Astros stepping up to help Uvalde stay strong. Welcome back. With so much acrimony surrounding us, we want to close this morning by giving some much needed attention to our better angels, the best side of ourselves. Today is Uvalde Strong Day at Houston's Minute Maid Park with the Astros playing host to thousands of our fellow Texans from that grieving community. Panel, I expect emotions will be intense, hopefully in the best possible way. Tomorrow, your thoughts. I think this is wonderful that the Astros are reaching out. I don't think people will grasp school is about to start. The worst days of that town's life was the last day of school. The wor Everybody on this panel, you couldn't wait to that last day of school. That was gonna be the happiest school day for you was the last day of school. And it turned it into a town's nightmare, a grandmother's nightmare, a mama's nightmare, a daddy's nightmare. The fact that the Astros are taking time to put some sunshine in the people's lives, I applaud you. Chow Wen, you're a professional in this area. Can yeah. these type of gestures help the healing? Yeah, we, we talk about post-traumatic stress disorder, but this is something called peritraumatic growth. By that, I mean this is still trauma that's ongoing in a community. So for uh, the city of Houston, the Houston Astros to take leadership and say, come on, Yavaldi, come on, community members. Let's just enjoy a day. Let's have a moment where we can come together as a community. It's so rare. We're so polarized. Even on, on this panel, we're polarized in our thoughts and our beliefs and values when it comes to politics. But at least this is something everyone can come together. And, and tomorrow's right. I mean, we're facing the first week of school this week in Uvalde and a lot of kids are doing it virtually. Got to leave it there. Last. Hey, thanks for joining us, everybody. The conversation continues on a national level next with Fox News Sunday. We will keep talking here with Watch Your Point Overtime streaming on fox26houston.com and on our Facebook page. From all of us here, have a safe and healthy week. Uvalde strong.